Morning. Um, so good morning to you. It's great to see um, so many of you and to be here today. Um, I'm Annie Hasbrook. I'm Director of Marketing and Communications at the University of Hull um, and I'm here with, with Chris Scott from Headscape. Um, what we'd like to do is just take you through our journey um, around prototyping um, for our digital transformation that we're undergoing at Hull. Um, we're going to go from both ends of the prototyping spectrum, um, primarily talking on, um, around the experience that we've had at Hull, but also exploring some work that Chris has also done at Edinburgh. Um, so I'd very much like to start around, you know, why prototyping and, and hopefully what we're going to share with you um, is what we've learned and why we really advocate prototyping in some of the transformational work that you might be looking to undertake in your own institutions. Um, so I guess Based on some of our experience and our objectives, um, fundamentally, prototyping for us has offered the freedom to actually experiment. So we can, in that very safe, in that very protected almost environment, really, really explore lots of different ideas and opportunities and see what works and what doesn't work. Um, a theme that's sort of come out today is that often the work that we do within the digital space everybody thinks they're an expert on and they have an opinion on so this offers a, a great sort of platform a sand pit um, to do some of that exploration work I guess secondly it's around disruption again a theme that's come out today it's about being able to really stop park everything that's happened in the past and start afresh and certainly um, for us at Hull that has been absolutely fundamental and one of the key benefits of undergoing the prototyping activity to just be able to put the past behind us and start basically with a blank sheet of paper. Collaboration is brilliant and again a theme that's also come out today but absolutely about bringing that team together but giving them the freedom to give them the empowerment to really um, explore their ideas again in that safe environment so nobody's sort of pulling them down or um, dismissing ideas it's a way to explore ideas be creative but also explore those challenges together as well um, and listening to each other and really start building and nurturing the team and then as we go through the prototyping process, again, what is hugely valuable is that user testing, but again, within that contained environment. So what has been, and Chris will talk about this a little bit later, but actually getting um, the user's opinions on what our assumptions are and making those tweaks and those improvements as we go along, again, within that sand pit environment. Um, and we can test some of those ideas very, very early on in the cycle, so again, from a sort of cost perspective and a reputation perspective it really really adds value to what we're doing um, learning and again I keep going back and calling it the sandpit environment but it is almost going back to some of the fundamentals of what we all had very early on in our education experiences of working as a team and learning from each other and from what our users are telling us and again it's something that within our world within the environments in which we operate we often don't have the opportunity to do that again without the spotlight being on us and everybody sort of putting their two pen a thin um, and again that has been brilliant from my my perspective in terms of building the team it's also been great to see and really understand where the strengths lie because sometimes people are not always um, confident about putting their ideas and the skills forward um, so it allows you to really see how the team can develop but also where you've maybe got some fundamental gaps or even some smaller gaps that either need filling you know from a new resource point of view or more from a developmental point of view um, which again is really, really helpful. Um, and then prioritisation, again, colleagues have, have discussed it this morning, um, but about figuring out particularly those de design priorities and getting that user data to influence actually what are the areas that we should prioritise from the user point of view, not necessarily from the internal thinking point of view. Um, and then selling it in and what we've found um, through the prototyping at Hull is that it is absolutely brilliant to be able to share what we're doing but having then that evidence that can sell our ideas and really push our ideas forward so again prototyping without doing prototyping we wouldn't have had that in place um, and linked to that is just the confidence it gives not just me as the, the the head if you like of the team but the entire team the confidence to actually go out and advocate what they're doing and it has been for me it has been absolutely fantastic to see that and just the confidence um, and the passion growing in the team and, and and then being advocates for it 
Peter. Um, Chris is going to talk a, a lot more in detail around the work that we've been doing. Um, but I just want to sort of take you, you back to the position that we were before we started working with, with Headscape in, in Hull. I would say that I wasn't here in 2014. I only joined last year, so I'm still relatively new to Hull. Um, but if any of you have done your research and been on our website, you will see it is one awful horror story. You know, Star Wars, it most certainly ain't. This is, um, you know, Nightmare on Elm Street, or Nightmare in Hull, as you would call it. So even back in 2014, we had, you know, this just out of control, this totally unfocused, um, internally driven website, not fit for purpose. The CMS is held together with sticking tape, no user focus, no sense of using that sort of data-driven approach. Um, and again, as colleagues have explored, a web team operating at best reactively, but very, very much firefighting and not able to deal with those priorities and, and, and that, that strategy, moving that strategy forward. Um, so in terms of why, I guess, we embarked on, on the, um, the prototyping piece, and particularly our work with Headscape, was you know, fundamentally to disrupt business as usual. As I said very early on, um, it's about putting that line in the sand and, and not accepting where we have been, realising that it is now a new moment for us. If we want to move forward, we really, really have to do this um, and focus on the future rather than the past. Um, but I'll now hand over to Chris, who will just share a little bit more about what the work that we've been doing together. Okay, thanks, Anya. Um, so what I'd like to do is... Um, compare and contrast a little bit with a, a, another project that we've been working on recently with the University of Edinburgh. So there the, the aims of the project were rather different. So we took a different prototyping approach which, which I think gives me uh, a foundation to present some ideas about how to think about prototyping. So that's what I want to do. Um, so l let's, let's compare now with Hull's, Hull's aims here with Edinburgh's aims. So Edinburgh's in a situation where the Chief Knowledge Officer is attempting to get some traction with uh, a major digital transformation program. So it's fairly early days and there's, there's an emerging vision for what that might be like. Um, and what, what he commissioned us to do was to try and communicate a vision of, of future uh, student digital experiences. Um, and so it's, it's motiv motivated by this agenda for transforming how the University at Edinburgh does digital. So rather, rather different to the, 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 the more um, practical how are we going to rebuild the, the web presence uh, aims of, of Hull. Uh, so it's more of an internal communications challenge, uh, I guess is the way that, that I'd sum that up. So what I, what I want to talk about then are six success factors for prototyping. So here, here are six that, that I'd like to propose to you. Uh, it's a way of thinking about prototyping. So if you're planning a prototyping project, it's almost like a checklist for things to think about before you embark on it as you're planning it. So here are the, the six factors that I'd like to talk through. So uh, le let me take these one at a time. Um, so first of all, let's look at, at visual fidelity or visual accuracy, okay? So how precise do you need the, the visual aspects of the prototype to be? Um, so let's, let's look at some of the, the assets from Hull. So here's, here's something that was produced pretty much um, close to real time in a workshop setting. You've seen it all before using something like balsamic. We used a, a hull combination of balsamic and, and Aksha. Um, and and these, these are things that were built up during workshop sessions. Okay, so it's very fast, very rapid. Um, we, we also prototyped at hull, and I'll come back to this later, using a CMS. Um, so that's, that's close to real time, but not real time. So here's, you know, one screen. The one screen actually with a, an image in it, it was the only one. A designer has to put one in somewhere, so he put one in here on the home page uh, for the, the alpha prototype that we, we built using Drupal. Now, if we look at, at Edinburgh, uh, 
a, a, as a comparison to this. So if you remember, what, what we were trying to do with Edinburgh is, is communicate this vision of, of the future, what the future might look like. Um, so visual appearance was very important. So Edinburgh, um, as, as Neil was talking about yesterday, have got this global experience language that's been developed and, and rolled out for much of the website, the public facing website. So what we started to do was do some imagining of how that might be applied to the internal student digital experience. So we were building things that looked like this. Well, building is a, is a bit of a strong word. Um, we were making things that looked like this. Okay, so these, these weren't clickable, usable things. So it's, it's simply presenting ideas, but here, the visual fidelity was important. So the, the various um, pieces where we were taking, you know, selections of what students are experiencing currently at the University of Edinburgh and going, okay, here's, here's what you've got now. Here's what it could look like, right? Here's what it could morph into, you know, changing the, the design look and feel and uh, some of the terminology used, that sort of thing. So this isn't the result of a long, careful piece of um, design research, uh, of, of exploration. It's, it's more setting the scene and starting that communication internally with, with stakeholders at the university. Okay, so that's the role of this, this prototype. So that's, that's visual fidelity. Next we come on to interactivity. So do you need your prototype to support user interactions is, is really the key question. So at Hull, this was really important, both for stakeholders uh, who needed to, really we, we needed to, to be able to show stakeholders this is what we mean when we, we're talking about uh, user-centric design. This, these are the sort of interactions and journeys that, that users may be able to, uh, to take up using the website. We also needed to be able to do user testing, okay, and we'll, we'll come back to that a, a little later. Um, so, you know, we were building stuff. This is one of the reasons for choosing a CMS. We're building stuff um, like, you know, here's one of the, the mega menus on the site. So the, the navigation system worked. You have related links. You've got taxonomies that we were using um, and so on. Conversely, if we look at Edinburgh, we were building these fairly high fidelity uh, user interfaces, but th the level of interactivity required was essentially zero, okay? So th this is as far as it went to overlay a blob on a PowerPoint presentation because the, the, the role of this, pr this prototype was in a setting more like this, pre being presented. So what was key about it was that it was flexible and that it could be cut down to 10 minutes or expanded out, uh, expanded out to an hour long presentation. So it was built using PowerPoint. So click on the orange blob, you would go through to a screen like this about a, you know, a lecture and here you click through to the video of the, of, the, of the lecture, for example. So just demonstrating these little bits, snippets or it almost of, of the user journeys. So what about tools? So tools is the third dimension, if you like, of the six. Um, there are loads of options. I'm sure lots of you have used um, the, the tools that I've mentioned. Um, so at, just a reminder, at Hull we use Balsamic, we use Axia and we use Drupal. And at Edinburgh, we used Photoshop and we used PowerPoint. And PowerPoint, just because it's usable on as many platforms as possible for those who might, might need access to the outputs from the work and, and need to present it to others. Okay. The other thing we used at, at Edinburgh actually was um, uh, Silverback to capture user interviews, to capture this sort of body of evidence uh, to support the need for change. 
Okay, so let, let's explore a little bit more why the need for a CMS and, and its value for prototyping. Uh, and it's, you know, that's an important decision to make. Am I going to prototype using a CMS or not? Because the CMS does add some overhead. I think the key reason for me is interactivity. You know, if you need to be able to do user testing using the prototype you, you want to build, if that's one of the, the objectives for it, then think seriously about using a CMS. Sure, you can do some interactivity using tools like, like Axure and so on, um, but what you can't build this is the sort of you know, all of the, the, the richness of relationships, taxonomies, that kind of functionality you can't build using Axia, okay? And, and we, that's a, that was why we chose to, to prototype with, with Hull on a CMS. Another, another key reason is that with a CMS, what we could do was, um, if you like, disrupt the lives of, of content editors, CMS users at the university who were just so used to using a very, very obsolete uh, platform that's, that's there at the moment. Um, so even if it, the, the prototyping content management system isn't going to be the final CMS that's used for the production product at the end of the line, it still enables uh, CMS users to start exploring how they're going to manage the, all the questions around how they're going to manage and connect content. Okay, so here's, you know, here's a list of the, the things, sort of things that I've been talking about. Other, other things you can start exploring with this prototype uh, are things like breadcrumbs and URL structures and those content workflows. Okay, the, the next dim dimension is that of the team. And there's been a lot of talk already today about teams. So who, who do you need to involve? Who do you really need to involve? Okay, so <clears throat> I think the first point is start with the web team. You know, and I'll, I'll, I'll come on to business specialists and, and others in a, in a second. But you know, start with your web team. You need some content people, you know, you've got to get some content in, so you have to have content people. You have to have a UX designer who's going to be doing wireframing live in workshops, so real time if you like. You need a CMS developer who's going to be building on the CMS near live, so kind of following up. So the way we work with Hull is that, that the, our CMS developer was sitting in on all of the sessions and, and kind of building as much as he could during the session, but then following up at the end of the day with, with builds. So it needs to be someone who's very competent at, at putting simple things together very quickly in your CMS. Another thing that we found that was really good at, at, at Hull was someone, in this case Anya, coming in at the end of the day. So she wasn't there throughout all of the sessions all of the time, but coming in the end of the day, to critique, to ask really pointed questions, to you know make sure our noses weren't too close to the grindstone, um, and to facilitate those end of day reviews, and those were really good. And of course, you need someone to facilitate the sessions to move things along. I'll come on into in, in a couple of minutes about what those sessions looked like. So, what about business specialists? So, you know, we've talked, uh, it, many people have talked about the need to work closely with people from business functions around the organization when you're working on a particular bit of functionality. Um, I think that's, it, it can of course be incredibly valuable, but of course it's difficult to second them. You've got all those barriers of diaries and scheduling and, and access to, to specialists. You know, if you want someone from admissions, you need to plan them in six weeks in advance and then they cancel last minute, all that sort of stuff. You know, actually, what we found was, and what we found time and again in working with universities is the people in web teams have an enormous amount of knowledge. And you can make enormous progress without pulling in specialists from around the organization. It's great when you can get them. But building a prototype, you're building a discussion piece. You're building something that's going to facilitate dialogue. And so, you know, just go for it. 
don't, don't get held up by having to wait for, for specialists, business specialists from around the organization. Related to team, the working environment is, is a really important thing. And, and what we found was vitally important was to protect, to protect, to survive. Now, there are one or two gray, gray hairs like me around here who might remember back in the day, in 1980, I think it was, the UK government published this little booklet. Every household in the nation got it. It was about how to protect yourself and your family and to survive nuclear attack. Okay. Um, it, it had a helpful guidance like this about um, protecting and sheltering your team uh, or your family. Um, so it was about using bits of furniture uh, to survive nuclear attack. We didn't quite do that for, uh, for, for the work with Hull, um, but we did, we did shelter the team by taking them away to um, the, the very lovely Mercure Hull Hotel. Uh, which did actually fantastic food. It? It's really good. Where everybody put on weight during that that week. Um, so, but but seriously, it, it you know somebody who is it? Stephen, I think, talked yesterday at, at his workshop about 56 interruptions per day on average. Um, a huge. So we were trying to reduce that. Obviously, they don't go to zero. But, but just to give this team protection to get some momen momentum going on this, this work. So let's look a bit at, at the process. So what we did was work in short, short bursts. So Headscape were, were asked to facilitate and fill some of the gaps where, where there were capability gaps for the prototyping. Um, and we, we worked, so we worked in short bursts um, with some preparation and then at Hull, uh, uh, and then some follow-up. So something like this, you know, here's, here's a picture. So here's the preparation at a fairly low level of intensity. Here's a dedicated session, call it a sprint if you like. Um, so the first one was four days, and then I think three days and, and two and a half days. Um, so we did three, three lots like this. Um, and, and this was the planned follow-up activity. Now, one of the things we discovered was that that planned follow-up uh, up suffered from increasing interruption and declining momentum. So that, that was you know, a bit of a, a learning point for us. Um, it was just hard to maintain that level of, of activity that we'd hoped for. So the, you know, if we look at, at, at it over the, the course of the prototyping work that we've done, it really looked like this. So we had these three bursts with a bit of a gap and a bit of, of loss of momentum in between. So we'll, we'll come back to some of the learning points later. Um, finally, I want to talk about the, the, the life cycle. So when you're planning a prototyping project, what is it that you, you want to do with the prototype? You know, is it to present as a part of an internal comms strategy? Is it to you do user testing? Is it to do uh, stakeholder engagement? What, you know, you need a plan. Um, and here's, here's just a little clip of video of how, just from one of the sessions, the user testing sessions we did at Hull. Um, and and you're, you're able to start doing really good things like in the same session, getting users to compare and contrast the current site with what you're prototyping. So, I just want study. We have one. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. And I brought me to this. Yeah. Um, I shall look at undergraduate chemical engineering. Okay. So, it tells you all the different types of courses that there are in it, which is very useful. To where you're seeing the types? Up at the top, right below chemical engineering, it has normal chemical engineering, foundation year, industrial placement, year abroad, masters. Masters with industrial places and masters with a year abroad, okay. which you know I myself am not interested in. But I do know people who did chemical engineering, and when they were going to look at it, the first thing they wanted to see is if there was one with an industrial placement. Ah, okay. Yeah. Can you try and find um, chemical engineering with an industrial placement on the live website there? Mm, okay. Uh... And and tell me what you're thinking as you you moving around this site? 
I first thought was it was a lot easier on that one when you just went on to study and it was like, here's the list of the courses. And like it was it wasn't obviously all of them, but it had like the main ones that if you quickly wanted to find them, they were there. Yeah. It was this one I went on to study and I was like, Wow, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Which bit will it be under? Probably courses. Okay. Yeah. So then I go on to that. And it's taking while to load. And it's got an A to Z, which is quite useful because sometimes you're scrolling through and you're like, this is taking a while. Yeah. So you see you know, a really nice comparison of different experiences in two different places with the, 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 the tester coming up with some ideas there as well. It's a really, a really creative interaction. So at Edinburgh, it was, you know, more like this. Well, actually, yeah, this was the only picture I could find of a, the inside of a lecture theatre at Edinburgh. It wasn't quite like that. Um, okay, so, Anya, over to you to talk about some of the wins. Yeah, just based on our experience, and we're still in that process of we're doing some more work with the prototyping and taking that into the beta phase of the main development now. Um, but what have been the wins? What have we really found that have, have worked? Um, so absolutely, going back to what I said earlier about the confidence in our user-centric design approach and actually how we can sell that into other stakeholders, both internally and externally, um, has been absolutely fantastic. The other piece is, and again, I th I'm not sure if we touched on it earlier, but you know, there's a sense of, well, is prototyping not just a bit of a waste of resource because you're not actually doing it and taking it um, and moving it on to that beta phase? Absolutely not. It is a, such a valuable piece of work and you can reuse not only a lot of the processes um, and content, um, but you, your entire learning. So you're actually in a much better position when you go into that sort of beta development and then taking take in live uh, as well. Um, brilliant to see those ideas actually brought to life and as Chris has just demonstrated testing some of that in a live space in a live environment but making those um, further iterations if you like again based on very live and, and responsive feedback um, and linked to that the validation um, of some of those key features from a user perspective is incredibly helpful and again um, is a great use of time and actually saves a lot of time because again you're doing it in that sand pet environment rather, in a, rather than in a fully live environment. Um, as part of our process at Hull, we were very keen to um, develop um, and implement a new CMS system. So again, the work that we were doing in the prototyping allowed us to ask the relevant questions of the CMS providers that we were engaging with. So that was, again, incredibly helpful. Um, and I guess just moving on to the lessons learned. So hopefully that, that's encapsulated the wins. But in terms of you know, what we've really learned and that we would really pass on to you is, as Chris described, absolutely minimize um, the gaps between those prototyping sessions. It is critical to keep that momentum going and keep it moving forward. Um, and protecting the team there um, is vital. Um, document prototype um, evolution and decisions, um, again, have that almost library that you can reflect back on to really understand why you've made decisions. And I think, as Duncan was saying, you know, particularly if somebody new comes into the team and then doesn't know why a particular decision has been made, that's really, really valuable. Um, absolutely making the time to train people, and particularly your editors, in terms of adding content into the CMS, whether that's within your, your whatever your team looks like and wherever they sit, or in terms of how you're empowering those wider content editors across the institution. Um, and the um, CMS based prototyping. Um, it's not real time as we've explored but it really really is worth it for all of the reasons that we've dis described um, today. Um, so very quickly with a, a minute left to um, just I guess summarise what we've said is prototyping, I'm the biggest advocate of it, I'm not a technical specialist at all as you can probably gather but from that almost strategic point of view and being able to really advocate this across the entire institution it is worth its weight in gold it allows you to do everything that we've said today um, so certainly the message from Hull and from Chris I think is is go out there and get prototyping and thank you very much for your time today